All right, we are in the book of Acts, and um, we're looking at uh, our memory verse is uh, Acts 9.16. Do we not have, oh, you have yeah. See. So let's say this together then, Acts 9.16, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's right. So if we do suffer uh, for his name's sake, uh, we're to rejoice because the suffering here is not the end of all things. Uh, very little compared to eternity. And um, so we are actually blessed for eternity if we are chosen to suffer <clears throat> uh, for Christ's sake. All right, we are... Uh, we, we have seen the uh, Saul of Tarsus becoming saved, uh, confronted by Jesus Christ himself. The men with him heard a sound and evidently saw a light, but they, they didn't uh, see the man, Christ. They didn't hear the voice. And, um, and so he's, uh, when the vision is over, he's blind and uh, went to Damascus. Ananias is called to come and lay hands on him for healing, and that is accomplished. Scales f fell from his eyes. And now Paul has um, some experience in Christian work. He preaches to the Jews at Damascus, uh, much to their surprise, and uh, uh, actually went to Arabia for three years, and then he comes back, and they say, we've got to get rid of this troublemaker. We're going to kill him seems to be the Jewish way of handling problems. And uh, so the disciples load, let him down off the wall, over the wall, in a basket. We then see Paul's conciliation in Jerusalem. Remember now, Jerusalem was his place uh, where he was, where he became, rose to um, the uh, uh, Torquemada, you know, the the persecutor of, the head persecutor of, of Christians. And um, so now he comes to Jerusalem, and this is presenting himself as a believer. So first of all, Paul finds fear, not, not that he was afraid, but when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, he tried, attempted to join himself to the disciples. He wanted to go to church. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. This sounded like it could be a trick by the clever uh, deceiver, clever persecutor, and uh, thinking that he, they expose all of the Christians to him and then he takes them away. So assayed means attempted or tried. And the verb is in the imperfect tense, indicating repeated tries. He re repeatedly tried to join himself to them. However, Saul finds a friend, verse 27, but Barnabas, good old Barnabas, son of consolation. The name Barnabas means son of consolation, one who consoles. Uh, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, the head of the, the uh, disciples, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, it does not say how he knew that, but he had it on good authority, and uh, perhaps uh, had talked to Ananias, maybe talked to other people, uh, because that would have been the big news all over Damascus uh, in the Christian world. Now, it says that uh, he brought him to the apostles. Now, the word apostles seems to be a general reference to the church leaders. And we have to come to that conclusion. Barnabas himself is, in the book of Acts, is called an apostle, uh, which in the lesser term, we would, we would write it with a lowercase a, uh, means a, a missionary, one who's sent for a purpose. But a, <clears throat> we, we find out that... Um, Paul tells about this meeting in Galatians 1, 18 and 19. It says this, Then after three years, that's 
uh, after many days we were talking about before. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But of the other apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now, James was not one of the 12 disciples, so he was not the capital A apostle. But uh, he was the uh, pastor of the church there. So uh, what we find is at this meeting, Paul met only Peter and the Lord's brother James at this time. Then after three years is probably computed from the time of his conversion. So uh, that was, we, we were there for that meeting. He went to Damascus. He left for Arabia, then came back that total of three years when he then goes to Jerusalem. The word translated to see, which is used only here, is a Strong's 2477, historeo, and means literally to gain knowledge of by visiting. Quite a complicated word, to gain knowledge by visiting. So uh, to go visit somebody to gain knowledge. So Paul means he went to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Peter. Abode with him 15 days indicates an overall short visit, but one that possibly was extended to get to see Peter. So the word abode, uh, interesting in itself, 1961, the, the strongest number, may indicate a prolonged stay. Frederick Rendell's The Epistle to the Galatians says, if the visit was prolonged, it may have been because the disciples were afraid of Paul. So uh, evidently, he thought, I'll spend a day or two with Peter, just let him know what's happening to me, and uh, so on. But uh, got there, and Peter, perhaps one of the ones that didn't want to see him, so repeated tries, he finally gets him there. Total of 15 days he spends there, but in that amount of time, he finds what's going on. Uh, he relates his conversion experience. Note that Barnabas' introduction of Saul included enough details, how he had seen the Lord in the way, seen the Lord, had spoken to him, and uh, had been commissioned to do the work. Uh, that was enough to show that Paul was qualified to be an apostle. Um, not everybody that would like to be an apostle is qualified. You have to have personal knowledge of Jesus. You had to see him, hear him, and um, be sent by him. So uh, he will be an apostle. Uh, he will be recognized as an apostle. So Paul finds fear, then a friend, and then freedom. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So evidently not staying there, but going out and doing some other things. But he also finds some foes, some enemies. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed of all people against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. He gets that a lot. He gets that a lot. Um, it's interesting, to me at least, that Saul returns to the Grecians, the Hellenistic Jews, to whom Stephen preached, and they sent him out to be killed, before he agreed, before, when, when, when all this was happening with Stephen, Paul, Saul, agreed with the stoning. Now he preaches the same Jesus. He's standing in the place of the martyr Stephen, see, and preaching the same Jesus, and with as much authority. The Hellenistic uh, Hellenists react the same way to Saul as they did to Stephen. They went about, that is, they put their hand to the work of slaying Saul. You know, there's something wrong with your religion when your way of dealing with people that don't believe is killing them. I say this full knowledge, of, that's the way the Muslims work, uh, many of them, and there's something going on today, Sun sundown at Nawal Bim or something. Sundown and ends tomorrow at sundown. I don't know what that is, but I'm guessing it's an Islamic thing. 
So having stirred them up and knowing that the Sanhedrin was willing to stone Stephen, they say this man is too valuable to lose. We, we learned once you can't trust them to do right. So we find next Saul finds flight. Which when the brethren knew that he was being threatened, they brought him down to Caesarea, down from the level of Jerusalem, down to Caesarea, which is a city at the seaside, and sent him forth to Tarsus. Now at the bottom of the blue, if you can read the word Jerusalem, the big dot at the bottom, that's Jerusalem. Then going down the slope to the border, you see the red line, that's Caesarea, uh, named for Caesar, and then by boat, uh, that straight line going clear up to the top, and that's Tarsus. Yeah. We can actually see him rowing. It's been really great there. So um, that's, uh, that's the way this uh, worked, and you see this is, and Tarsus is where he grew up. That's his hometown, where he was born. So he's, he's back at home. Um, there's a, a time when, Christ, when uh, Paul says that for Christ, uh, everything was taken away from him, and the tense used indicates that it happened all at once. It uh, makes me think that when he got there, now being saved, he got to Tarsus, and uh, he's son of a Pharisee, so uh, strongly Jewish, I'm, and, and he talks about how he lost everything. I think it was there at this time that he being the Christian that he is now and the outspoken Christian that he is, I think that's when he was disowned by his family. Um, hopefully through the years, uh, things changed. Man, people got saved. But uh, he goes home for safety, just physical safety, but at the same time, heartbreaking time when, when evidently uh, the indications are, it's not told us directly, but the indications are that he uh, lost his heritage at that point. So uh, that's where he was taken. So if you go back to see Acts 22, 17 to 21, at God's prompting at the help of the disciples, he's sent away to Caesarea and from there to Tarsus, his hometown. Tarsus is still in existence today. It is located in Isel, Ikel, I don't know how to pronounce it, province in southern Turkey on the west bank of the river Pamuk. In 1997, which is the last time they did a population count, the population was 163,000 people in Tarsus. It's there that Barnabas will seek him for the work in Antioch in Acts 11.25. So uh, that's where he stays. Uh, here and, and in Tarsus, uh, it's a Gentile city. So the Jews don't have great power there. So even if they were quite irritated with him, they wouldn't have the authority, they wouldn't have the power uh, of, of uh, authority of government to, uh, to kill him. And so he, dare I say, uh, uh, exercises his abilities, practices his, his uh, speaking skills on Gentiles there in Tarsus. Uh, perfect preparation for him to work at the Gentile church at Antioch. Now, we find next that we're done with Saul for a bit. Uh, we see the church finds freedom, and it's included in this section about Saul because uh, I think that's the connection of uh, why the church found freedom. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, being built up, being fed the word of God, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The church was growing, churches in all those areas growing. Dr. Alvin McLean in his great book, The Greatness of the Kingdom, said, 
While various factors may have contributed to this temporary condition of rest, its connection with the biblical record with the conversion of Saul has not received the attention it deserves. For the time being, the Jewish persecution had lost its leading genius to the other side. Furthermore, Jewish hatred had been diverted to the person of Saul, not to the church in general, and he had been spirited away from Jerusalem to Tarsus, where he was beyond their reach. Uh, there was not a big enough Jewish presence in Tarsus. Tarsus was considered a university town. They didn't build buildings for universities, but uh, philosophers and teachers from all around the world would come there and find uh, uh, people that they could talk to. They would gather a group here and there and sit and talk or walk and talk. Uh, so um, you didn't kill people for having different ideas in Tarsus. All right, that ends our <clears throat> point B, the miracle of Paul. Going back, we see the ministry of Philip, which is um, chapter 8, 1 to 40. The miracle of Paul then, chapter 9, 1 to 31. And now we return to Peter, and we look at the ministry of Peter. You remember, and I am going to be dealing with this in the morning message, that um, in John 17, uh, sometimes called Christ's high priestly prayer, this is him talking to God, um, he asks God to give his disciples the ability, and he says that they're going to do the same works that Christ did, and his disciples will do even greater works because his work was limited. He was going to go to the Father, die and re be resurrected. Um, so we're going to now see how that worked out in practice because we see what, what's happening with Peter. And this is chapter 9, 32 to 43. We see the first thing that we are, are told here by... Uh, Dr. Luke, the uh, historian, the miracle of healing. Now, the setting of the healing, verse 32, it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwell at Lydda. The city of Lydda is northeast of Jerusalem. And um, what we, uh, uh, so he's traveling in all the, I don't know, distant suburbs there. The situation of the healing, and there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years. He was not lazy, he was paralyzed. He was sick of the palsy. Palsy is paralysis. So Aeneas was paralyzed eight years. What I find interesting here is that it, when we were talking about Dorcas, uh, when we will talk about Dorcas, um, she was called a disciple. This man is just called a certain man. Now, I don't know uh, if this was an act that led him to be saved, Aeneas, or if it was a thing that he was saved, but he wasn't much interested in following the things of God. At any rate... <laughs> we see the surprise of the healing in verse 34. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Peter was a neat person. He wanted him to make his bed. After all, he'd been laying in it for eight years. So time to make that bed probably a pad that he rolled up and so on. The words that Peter used emphasized that it was Jesus who was doing the healing. Uh, this is not me by my power, you see. And then, indeed, we see the salvation through the healing. In verse 35, And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him standing, walking, and turned to the Lord. They said the power of God is here. Saron is what is the, called in the Old Testament the plain of Sharon, the name of the area around the city of Lydda. 
There's another miracle. This is miracle of resurrection. Uh, Peter is busy here, 36 to 43. The record of Dorcas, 36 and 37. The deeds of Dorcas, verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. I find that interesting. The two words mean the same thing. Uh, pleasant word in, in English, gazelle. Gazelle, essentially. Like the name Giselle. You know? um, but Dorcas, to us, sounds pretty, I don't know, clunky, you know. Hey, Dorcas. <laughs> uh, but uh, Tabitha is not too bad. But both of them mean gazelle. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. So she did a lot of good works, and she cared for those who couldn't help themselves. Tabitha, Strong's 5,000. Tabitha, just as we would say it. The Greek form of the Hebrew name, and I show you what the Hebrew is, uh, the Hebrew word 6646, and it is Tzabiya. <laughs> but it meant, in the Hebrew, gazelle or doe, uh, female gazelle. Dorcas is Strong's 1393, and it's just those, those letters, D-O-R-K-A-S, the, the triangle is the capital D, Dorcas, which is the Greek word for gazelle. So a beautiful animal and a beautiful name. Um, in Greek, sounds kind of dorky, but uh, Dorcas. So the deeds of Dorcas, and then the death of Dorcas, there's no, no question here, but she died. Here the scripture says it came about, came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. So it wasn't a rumor that she died. It wasn't that she was so sick she looked like she was dead. She died. Whom, when they had washed, they washed the body, they laid her in an upper chamber. So this was sort of a, a place of the viewing until they would bury her. Now, uh, I'm going to guess that they didn't call Peter after she died. Um, I'm not sure they would have suspected that Peter could raise people from the dead. Um, that would have been amazing faith, and it's certainly possible. There's nothing against it in what the scripture says. But I'm thinking just on the normal that, that she was very sick, looked like she could die, and they said, we just heard that Peter's close. Run, go get him. So, you know, take some time. They couldn't take a taxi. Uh, they had to, had to find and say where he was and so on. So the response of Peter, how Peter was summoned, verse 38, and forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. So the word spread, and they sent him uh, unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. So if she was already dead, why did he have to hurry? You see, my, my thinking is that the words here indicate she was sick and looked like she was dying. So they said, have him hurry best he can. Nigh to Joppa, Homer Kent in his commentary, says Joppa was on the Mediterranean coast, 10 miles from Lydda. Today it's called Jaffa and is adjacent to the modern city of Tel Aviv. Desiring, desiring that he would come, is para kaleo. We've used, talked about that word a lot. Para alongside and kaleo to call. And it means here encouraging him to come. Could mean exhorting. You really need to come. Uh, certainly comforting him. It doesn't seem to fit here. Uh, comforting him to come. Take your ease. <laughs> they want him to hurry. So what had happened, the miracle man was close. Call him. He can heal. But by the time he gets there, uh, what Peter was shown, verse 39, then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, where you remember she had been laid for viewing, uh, to the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments. We'll explain that in a moment, which Dorcas made while she was with them. Again, very clearly, she was dead. Coats and garments, I just looked that up to see if it was specific. Um, uh, 5509 is 
Keton, he, Keton, and Strong's 2440 is Himation. So Richard Trench and his very valuable book, if you're studying these things, Synonyms of the New Testament, compares the words. Chiton is best expressed by the word tunic. A tunic was a close-fitting undergarment, usually worn next to the skin. Now, while we say an undergarment is only under if you were wearing the coat over the top of it, and um, uh, very often in work situations, uh, in working, it was the only garment worn. Then hemation and ketan are often found associated as the outer and undergarment. So uh, ketan was the undergarment, the close-fitting tunic, and then the other was the robe that would put over it. All right, um, so the response of Peter. We see now the raising of Dorcas, raising of Dorcas, uh, 40 and 41, <clears throat> putting forth the mourners, but Peter put them all forth. He said, leave me alone with the body. Something like that. Praying for direction in verse 40, the second part, kneeled down and prayed. Uh, this is not something that he walked around knowing he could raise the dead. He comes and he says, to work the best here, this woman could be brought back to life. And he talks about this with God, with the Lord Jesus, perhaps. And having prayed, and evidently having that assurance being given to him, we see number three, pronouncing the command and turning him to the body. He was perhaps kneeling someplace off to the side. Now getting up, turning to the body, said, Tabitha, Arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Oh my goodness, who are you? <laughs> and what am I doing in this room? Now, I have a confession to make. Uh, I confess to being personally confused about such resurrecting of the righteous dead. If I were the fellow that died, if I were the person who died, and I'm in heaven and I'm with the Lord Jesus and I'm enjoying the thrill of ending of my life, and all of a sudden they say, oops, you got to go back, and Peter whisks me back into this world of sorrows, I don't think I would be happy. I'd be getting up and swinging, saying, oh, yeah, why would you do that? Everything was great there. So it's just confusing to me about what's going on. So I come up with a couple of ideas. Does God put these, whom he knows, of course, will be resurrected, does he put them in a special place and say, okay, this is as much of heaven as you can see right now because we have some other plans for you. Okay, it was nice for a tent. I like it. I don't know. Or does, do they, do they have all the experience of being raised from the dead, or all the joy of being raised to heaven, and see all the old friends and see Christ. And, and uh, then they say, now, we're going to send you back. It's, it's God's will, and you have good works to do. And uh, so when you wake up there, you won't remember any of this. See? I kind of like that one. But I, I didn't get a vote. So Anyway, I don't know. Then, presenting the woman, verse 41, and he gave her his hand, he was a gentleman, lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. What a surprise. Uh, they were weeping. They were grieving that this person who kept doing such good things was dead. And now she's back. And what do you suppose the result was? The result of her resurrection, verse 42, and it was known throughout all Joppa. You think that, that message got out? You think <laughs> they said, you know, the girl that died, she's not dead anymore. I mean, throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Power of God. And then finally, the residence of Peter. 
And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. A tanner is the one who takes the animals, uh, dead animals, and skins them and then treats the hide, tans the hide, so that, uh, come to think of it, that's what my mother said she was going to do to me, <laughs> tan my hide, uh, but um, made it into, into leather, uh, things like that. So Joppa, Joppa is on a sandy promontory raising up from the Mediterranean Sea. It's between Caesarea and Gaza. It's 30 miles now northwest of Jerusalem. We were over there, now we're over here and over by the sea. Um, it is one of the oldest towns in all of Asia. It was and still is the chief seaport of Judea. It became a Jewish town only in the second century BC, 200 years before Christ. It is known today as Jaffa or as Tel Aviv, Yafo. Jaffa, Yafo. Tel Aviv, Jaffa. Added the Tel Aviv to it. It is Israel's oldest port. This is when Peter began to stay with Simon the Tanner and Cornelius, the next adventure, Cornelius the uh, centurion, will be directed to find him here. Now, um, we're not surprised to find him there at a seaport area. Tanners dealt with dead bodies. And so the touching of dead bodies from all the Old Testament thing was, was forbidden to the Jews. Now, they had ways of doing it where it wasn't contagious, and God uh, allowed them to do that, and especially Christians who were beyond the Jewish rituals. But they dealt with dead bodies and were not very popular with the Jews. They often lived and worked by water for the cleansing of the skins and for the dispersing of the smells. So uh, he says, hi, I'm a tanner. He goes, yeah, I know, I know. It smells like that. See? So I don't know what the smells are, but there's some sort of chemicals used to, to uh, make the skins uh, leather-worthy. All right, then next week's memory verse from our lesson is Acts 9, 29. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. Again, this is Paul doing it. But they went about to slay him. They started the work to plot his death. So um, we see that Paul is seen here boldly speaking, speaking in the name. We're going to be dealing with that in the morning service. The uh, name of the Lord Jesus. So he is, he is doing what God commanded, what God especially commanded him, you see. Uh, you will speak to Gentiles, to kings, and to Israel. So here he is dealing with Israel, and about Israel about as Gentile as you can get. These were the people that lived outside of Israel, the, the uh, Hellenistic Jews. And he will learn how much he will have to suffer. They, start, they, they plan to kill him. So I think of this as a, a verse to embolden us, uh, Paul was living at a time when, and in an area here, uh, different from Tarsus, but he's back at Jerusalem now, um, talking to people that would as soon kill him for his testimony as believe him. All right, comments or questions? All right, thank you. All right, let's uh, stand together. We'll be dismissed with prayer. Father, you've given us the story of Paul in Jerusalem and then turning back to Peter, Paul having escaped uh, for his very life and to uh, live to preach some more, which of course he will do. But Peter also we recognize, uh, like many of the apostles, must have been busy about all of this. And yet it was Peter staying in that area, going to the church at Jerusalem that um, uh, gained quite a reputation, healing of a man that hadn't been able to move for eight years, and then the raising of the dead. We know that nothing that Christ did was withheld 
from the twelve as he told them with the coming of the Holy Spirit they would be given power to accomplish all these things. But we ask, Father, that you might help us to recognize that uh, we uh, see something of that power in us today. We think of uh, Brother Jeb Porter, uh, who perhaps uh, uh, we were praying for him that perhaps his lungs had been further scarred and that it would take extreme measures to keep him alive, and now finding that's just all gone away, uh, as if you had uh, just took, taken him back to that original problem time. Uh, you are able to do all that, and our work of miracles is today the work of prayer. We ask that you might guide and direct us then to recognize that there is nothing withheld from thee. You who created things in the first place, you who made man, are quite capable of restoring him to, uh, restoring anyone into uh, pristine health again. So guide and direct us in our faith to understand that you are the same God and we will serve you in the same way. We pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.